Today I might have this wild idea to talk about video games. Web? Just us or anyone well, important? Lovely people like Tim Hussain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lucy James. Lucy James. And also Phil Spencer and Matt Booty are joining join hey, us here on the couch. Hey, Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. It's nice. Yeah, this is nice. It's uh, When I was thinking about, like, oh, Summer Game Fest, things kind of getting back to normal. It's like, what is the thing that happens during the summer that makes it really feel like, oh, E3 to me? This is an E3. But it is. It, I still call it E3. I do too. I can't I help myself. It's I a bad it. habit. Right? No, it happen, it could happen. It could happen. Yeah, come yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's, it is Phil Spencer on a couch after a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could just say that. Yeah. Like, Phil Spencer on a couch <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> on a couch. There he is again. Yep. Look at him over Face the corner. Face down. Just point at him. No recognition of the eyes. Just Matt. Just leave him alone. Yeah. Matt trying to pick me up. Matt having to pick me up and carry me back. This camera's get up. I guess the first question is. How are you feeling today? You mm. guys had your big showcase this morning. It's got to be kind of nonstop. Uh, yeah. Have you had a chance to reflect on it? And, and you, you were saying earlier that usually you do this kind of thing a day later. Have a chance how, to like, yeah, I wouldn't call cookies. it kind of thing. I do this, this exact thing, thing. <laughs> a day, day later. after. So what's it been like to come here immediately? Yeah, it was, so first, great job, you guys. Great like job, I've been you. watching the, the content as much as I can, like yeah, between yeah, interviews and stuff. Um, and I appreciate you reaching out and giving us the opportunity to yep. come on and talk. So oh, cool. thank you. Thank you to everybody. Uh, yeah, like normally we do our briefing on a Sunday mm -hmm. and then Monday, like Sony and Nintendo go, and then I'd go on with Jeff on Monday night mm -hmm. and he could kind of beat me up about bad games or something. But we'd have like a good discussion. Yeah. But I'd had a little bit of time to kind of internalize what has been going on. And literally like from our showcase this morning, it's been like boom, interview, interview, interview. So. Um, I'm a little bit less connected to like the reaction to it, our the show. The reality is, so am I. Like yeah. I, I've been here all day, so talking about this stuff. Yeah. So I, I mean, maybe this will be like a little silo. We'll, we'll say a bunch of stuff that no one else is saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter at all. Unique perspectives from right. giants. As long as, as we have fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as Matt and I were like, yeah, you good? I'm good. Yeah. Okay. How about yeah. you, Matt? What's mm -hmm. it been like for you to to kind of like? be in it and then come here immediately. It's just, it just really feels good for the teams, right? right? Our teams, they work so hard that through all the challenges and all the expectations, they got to keep their heads down and work. And it was great that we had people from Obsidian, Turn mm. 10, In Exile, yeah. mm. in the audience. And just, I mean, it's a big moment for them, right? That, that, that's the thing I wonder about the most. It seems like these assets that you have to produce for these big events take more time and effort than they've ever taken before. Is that accurate? I mean, we start working on this show in January, February, so most of the teams will show up with storyboards of what they're going to present. We start looking at it like right after. That's six. Holiday. That's six. That's half a year. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. a lot for them because everybody, you know, it's it's part of our process, which is great. But there's a lot of eyeballs on it. There's a lot of feedback, a lot of rework, and and uh, <laughs> but you know, it pays off, right? So, but for the teams, for me, it's a combination of just feeling so proud for them happy that they get their moment in the sun, especially when it's something cool and when yeah. we can surprise people. Yeah. I'm just proud of them, right? Our team's yeah. been working so hard. Yeah, you said, you said it pays off. I, I mean, is there a math, a math that happens where you're like looking at it like, okay, you are gonna have to work on this asset for this thing that is a big promotional thing mm. for your game instead of maybe doing some work on the game itself. Is there a calculus there? Yeah, I mean, for us, ideally, we're taking stuff that's already been put together okay. and trying to put it in a package, right? Yeah. So Phil and I, uh, usually the day before Friday, we were at NXI, we're at an Obsidian, yep. seeing stuff. A year ago, we saw Clockwork Revolution played running, it. played it, Phil mm, played yeah. it on a console, mm -hmm. and you can see a lot of what we saw a year ago in the trailer. So that's, that's ideal right. because, and we're trying to get more and more to that where it's less stop what you're doing, go make this trailer, yeah, and more, right. what have you got running that we can capture that then becomes a great trailer. Right, that's right? exactly what I was wondering. So, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, so you, you talked about having this stuff prepared in advance. Obviously, these showcases are no longer just we're gonna show you things. It's also like a kind of a statement that you're trying to make or you're trying to present a message or are you trying to make sure that the audience knows where you're going with things? How do you deal with the nature of needing to be reactive to changing times and opinions? Obviously, jumping into the thick of it, you guys had a recent, the, the narrative around Xbox became kind of stuck on Redfall and needing to kind of bounce back from that. How do you, how do you react to that knowing that a showcase like this started its production six months ago? And do you suddenly have the kind of flexibility to be like, we need to change, move these pieces about so we can address this thing? Yeah, we honestly don't. 
and I, I know there were like I was watching some of the sleuths on the internet when the Persona stuff leaked, and people were like, "Oh, that was in Summer Games Fest, and they pulled it to put it in our show." Sure, yeah. And you're like, oh, "Yeah, no, no, no those right. things no. have been in the uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> our show was totally. in the can for yeah. ten days." So like, um, you don't rewind a little bit. I think it's kind of unfair for us to go to a team and say, "Hey, yeah. like the yeah. Xbox brand is in this." like has this weight on it right mm -hmm. now and it, wouldn't it be really great if your asset could be the thing that we could point out your game could right. be the thing that we point at that kind of changes that never which is not fair to any individual team yeah which is one of the reasons i mean this position is paid to be in front of the brand and mm -hmm. i'll go out there and um and listen and take the feedback and uh, and i think that's important but the show itself is the show like mm -hmm. we'll pick some themes Right. I think we knew this. We wanted a lot of big guys. There was a lot of big guys in a lot of the trailers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big guys, little big freaks. Big guys, little freaks. That was, that was the, we yeah. knew that First Party That's would be trendy. strong <laughs> in this show. We knew First Party. Like, 2022 was a light year for us on First yeah. Party, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but we also knew we've got over 20 studios building games and the progress that the teams were making. So I think early on, we were pretty certain this was going to be a strong First Party show. Yeah, right. And then as the assets started to come together, and you started to see the quality and having a couple of new IP announces, then I, I think is where it all really paid off. But mm -hmm. that's obviously through the planning of months, yeah. not in the last weeks. That, that time, you know, we'll get to that. I think that's that's interesting of like figuring out when these games can actually come out. Obviously, that's a problem for everybody. Mm -hmm. But you said something a minute ago where it's uh, uh, it's you would feel awkward going to these studios and say you need to help the brand, so do this. It is. It feels like, and still, and I think this is a good thing. I wonder what your opinion is on it. That you want these studios to be doing the things that they want to be doing, and then you guys figure out the best way to then empower that. Is is that, it is that what's happening? And then what are the issues that that causes? I'll just, I think so. Somebody asked me today, like you know, what do you? What's sort of the main thing you'd love to come out of this show? For me, I think one thing for us as a studio system is that this validates the approach because as you point out we put a lot of empowerment on our studio heads um, a lot of them are creative directors they help guide the project um, we don't have a system where there's a central sort of brain trust telling everybody what to make mm -hmm. so there's a lot of risk in that yeah. um, but when it pays off i think you see a variety of games uh, which is important to us and i think to your exact point you get the passion of what they want to make comes through in the pixels, right? So, um, you know, we've been trying to get that going for a couple, three years, and it's a little bit to Phil's point when people say, did you put that character in because of something that happened last month? I'm yeah, like, no. okay, that character was designed two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing that happened last week on this game, right? Um, and that means that we got to be patient, we got to know that it's going to pay off, and we got to get behind the studio heads that so much of what we do depends on them as yeah. leaders locally in their studio and owning the creative. Yeah, that, that also makes me wonder, like getting behind the studio, you uh, mentioned with, with Redfall, we're not going to like obsess over that, that uh, you guys- Do you want to do it again? I don't want to do it Redfall 2, is that what you just said? It <laughs> 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 They didn't get the support it needed, but then you said immediately after that, like, you know, we're doing that with Star Starfield. What did, what does that look like? I don't. You don't have to get the specifics, but like, if there's anything like color you can add to what that looks like, what does support for Starfield look like from your guys' perspective? And also, like, how much of that support is now being put into the games that are shown today? Is Fable mm -hmm. getting that level of support? Yeah, how's that? Is, is Avowed getting that level of support? Um, because it, when you first talked about it, 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 you indicated that it was like you were still kind of getting those engines warmed up, and that's kind of kind of why it didn't work in that end. Um, but are you at a stage now where the full kind of system is working as it should for all these other games? Go for it. Yeah. yeah. So first, I, one thing just to point out, I think with ZeniMax Bethesda, let's think about what's happened since acquisition. So they shipped Deathloop, yes. yeah. good game. Great Ghost game. Wire, yes. good game. Hi-Fi Rush, good game. So they Great got game. a system there. So a little bit of, is it something new? Not really, right? I think with Redfall and Starfield, the thing that we're applying on Starfield uh, we talked a little bit about it this afternoon. We've got first uh, the advanced technology group that sits under Sarah Bond, right? They know the Xbox hardware in and out. That's their lives, and they're there to help teams get frame rate graphics. They help with the ray tracing on Forza. You know, you ask, are they helping on Avowed? Mm. That's a place where we've got the Unreal expertise. So our studio, the Coalition up in Vancouver, 
I think that outside of Epic, yes. they are like yeah. tops in the industry on Unreal. So those are the kinds of things that we're able to apply. And, and is that working? Like, is that actually, is it been effective? Is that growing? Is it better than ever? How, what's the state of that? Well, I think on Starfield, Todd will tell you that we've been engaged since like early last year. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that it shows up in terms of how stable the game is, what they're able to put on screen in terms of graphics, but even a little bit also what it means to be a first party game. It's one of the things we talk about is, you know, a, a somebody like Double Fine comes in, they will never get to ship a game as just Double Fine no, again. It will always not. be looked at as first party. Yeah. It's, it, and, is that a little unfair to them? Well, I, I think that's where it's on us to yeah. support them early. And maybe that's something we could have done a little better with Redfall, but that is that transition that happens. And that's where I think the Starfield team would say that they feel supported. Yeah. In terms um, of... Okay. Oh, no, sorry, no, go, 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 no go I mean, back. I was going to jump to some uh, third-party question, Let's but it kind it. of like, goes into sort of looking at lineup. Obviously, the Persona stuff, Persona 3, leaked, um, but we still got the surprises, and we talked about, you know, reception of the show. A lot of people so stoked to see such incredible representation from Japanese devs in on Xbox. Mm. Um, what has that kind of process been like, uh, expanding and talking more to Japanese studios? Yeah. I, it's work. Like it is work because we're not the strongest brand in Japan. When you think about Sony, Nintendo, Switch, PlayStation, mobile, frankly, and the role that it plays for a lot of the players and creators there. Um, and I remember, like, kind of five years ago, it was when is an Atlas game going to come to Xbox? Mm. And yeah. um, so it was awesome to see three games. The two Let alone Game Pass. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Capcom announcing a new IP on the stage, also coming to Game mm -hmm. Pass, which is great. And I say all of that, and then I can look at my friends at Square and say, "Come on, <laughs> like, yeah. so you know, I got to get on an airplane again." And it for me, it's it's kind of all about trust and relationship. Um, they have to look at the global market. They have to listen and hear us in terms of what we stand for. Uh, we've done that over the years with From, and have a great relationship there. We're building relationships with Sega and Atlas mm -hmm. and Capcom and Bandai Namco. Like, mm -hmm. I love the work that we've done over the years. Uh, but it's always work for us in Japan specifically because we are we are the Xbox team. Mm -hmm. um, we're not a, a, a platform from Japan, and that's okay. Like we've got a good team there that's hard at work. Sarah Bond and I are over there quite a bit. I'm mean, just continuing to build the the, uh, the relationships, mm -hmm. and I love that you bring up like I just I thought our show represented mm -hmm. those creators well, and it was nice even with the leaks, which you know those things happen. I don't get all frustrated about those things yeah. but it, it was nice to see the support that we yeah. had in the show but we do have more work to do yeah. and I, I hear about it from the the fans yeah when you uh, when you do talk to these Japanese developers or publishers when they decide not to bring a game to Xbox what is the thing that they are saying to you that they yeah. that is the reason why yeah that's a hard it's not there's one nothing, no thing one um, yeah. sometimes there's business deals that are mm -hmm. done Sometimes as a team has a focus uh, that they're just, mm. hey, we can only support two or three platforms right. and they're just kind of reduced mm. development risk because it is real yeah. that every platform you add adds more work to the development team. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes it's just a team that doesn't have a lot of connection to Xbox. Right. Um, and they don't necessarily see it in their local game store mm -hmm. when they walk in. It's even why our presence on the ground with X, even if we're not selling as many consoles right. as the competition, if you go to Yodabashi Camera, like I want there to be an Xbox mm -hmm. section, yeah. I want there to be games that are shown because I also want the teams at kind of the base level to know that Xbox is a game platform and it's something that they see in their day and day lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I, I love the progress that we've made, I think, yeah. about like over the five or six years there, but there is, is obviously more work for yeah. us to do. From, from like the progress side, obviously it's been really difficult. I think game sales has been difficult to get a foothold in Japan in a major way, and for the longest time that's always been in the traditional console, physical, you know, kind of hardware space. Japan is more, perhaps more forward thinking and accepting of mobile and streaming yeah. and that kind of approach. So on the one, Part one of this is, have you seen any changes in kind of uh, adoption in Japan of the console side? And how does that relate to the kind of almost xCloud stuff? How, how is that working out in, or digital stuff? Is it something that is perhaps showing that it might be a better way for you to get into that market and, and, and kind of maintain a presence that the hardware doesn't kind of allow you to do? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take that to a global level, that every market, has its own unique qualities, whether it's 
the kind of socioeconomic situation in a given market, meaning like how much money are people free cash? Do people just have to go spend yeah. on this hobby that can get expensive and playing video games? How big is PC? How big is mobile as you talk about? And this is why I think for us, one of the keys has been choice yeah. on Xbox. You've got, wait, we even have coming up here three consoles now that you could go buy in this mm -hmm. generation. Yeah. Um, you can play on PC, you can play on mobile, you can stream, you can buy the games, you can subscribe through Game Pass to go play. And it's because every market feels a little bit different. Um, if you were just focused on what's called kind of the rich people markets, you would only sell $70 games and you'd only sell the most expensive piece of hardware that you could. But when we think about 3 billion people playing video games on the planet, every one of those countries is going to be, or even sometimes less like sub countries, yeah. uh, is going to have its own situation. Mm -hmm. And it's it adds complexity for us when we focus on choice for the customer and where our games can show up. But clearly a market like like Japan, it could have an impact, but there are so many other markets where it could as well. I, I find that um, it, when I'm thinking about the way I approach stuff, that, that niching down, niching down is uh, is effective in helping me grow. It's counterintuitive. Do you think that the uh, the idea of like three billion gamers out there, is, is that a distraction ever? Or, or, or is it something that you guys believe that you can execute on in a in a focused way? Awesome question. I'd say the, the thing, and maybe the three billion thing is overplayed for us a little bit. The thing I really focus on is that I want the industry to grow. Yeah. Right. And if every customer we're trying to find for Xbox currently has a competitor's platform, and all we're doing is trying to like bludgeon somebody else's yeah. platform share down for so that we will grow, I don't think it's, frankly, I don't think it's that interesting for us. Like right. the reason at a Microsoft level, the gaming industry is interesting is because it is growing, right? It's, I think, the most interactive community-led form of entertainment on the planet. Um, and we come to things like Fan Fest and we have customers from Australia and Ireland and the Middle East and Africa. And like they're all here in this Fan Fest and they're meeting each other. And gaming does that virtually every single night when people are playing. Uh, so what we're really focused on is how do we continue to grow this industry? And then, yes, from a competitive standpoint, I want to make sure we're getting our share yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. of that growth. But if all we were looking at is who else's customers are in the market and how do yeah. we go get their customers, we'd be better just kind of going away and letting the market continue what it is. But the market is growing. Yeah, like I guess like I would agree with that. And I, I definitely believe that. But there was also like a, you have to admit that there's the audience of gaming. They have an investment in an Xbox platform and sometimes they kind of sit there and they're like, we want to see that kind of like getting down and dirty and really fighting for you know, the, the audience as opposed to like, I guess they, they find it harder to relate to, we're trying to make the, the gaming uh, industry grow as opposed to mm -hmm. like, we, uh, we want to see our platform get better. Even like on a more yeah. basic level, it's, uh, uh, it feels like the best way, uh, if like, the business need is like growing Game Pass, which I don't know if it is for sure, yeah, but if yeah. it is growing Game Pass, like isn't the, the most effective way to do that to sell more Xbox consoles? And I guess it, that's probably your main focus still, right? Right. And so, I mean, there's a two different yeah, points, yeah. so go I want to make go. sure I, I mm -hmm. get both of them. Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely, the people who have invested in Xbox, it's our duty to make that payoff. And that's quality games, mm -hmm. that's games coming on a regular cadence mm -hmm. every year, and, and we didn't do that in 2022, right. right? And we heard the feedback. 2021 was a good year, yeah. 2022 was not a good year. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year we've had some good releases and we had Redfall, which was not a good release. Right. Um, so I, in this show, I love seeing the reaction, but now we're going to go ship those games. Yeah. Yeah. And like play. then that's yeah. really what I, I think when we deliver. In terms of the Game Pass question specifically, I just want to make sure it's not about growing Game Passes. Are, we want to make sure the game industry is growing. And we do think that helps the players on our platform. It's probably a longer discussion, happy to do it, yeah. but on, on why that why that is. In terms of Game Pass specifically, Game Pass is kind of a means to an end, yeah. which is mm. we just want more people to be able to play more games. Mm. And the cost of a video game is something that keeps some people from playing, like the right. upfront cost, even from trying new things. So we think a kind of zero marginal cost way of somebody clicking on an icon and downloading a game is, is an awesome way for people to try games they might never have played before. Mm. Most of the people who are like most of our use of cloud is actually people playing on console who are playing the game before they Trying actually download it, sure, yeah. right? And we think that's that's an awesome yeah. awesome choice in terms of growing Game Pass specifically. To your point, sorry, I'm just kind of un yeah, un I don't understand. Question. Fair enough. Most of the growth in Game Pass right now is on PC. Yeah, and it's just because there are hundreds of millions of PC players, and and Game Pass 
kind of we started there later um, and we we have work to do to become kind of more native on PC and support the platform completely. And most of our growth right now comes from PC. And I think to your point of the easiest place for us to grow is actually on PC. It is. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, well, because you don't have to sell a piece of hardware. Right. right. So if you look on Xbox, you say a lot of the players who own an Xbox are already in Game Pass, which is awesome. Yeah. Like we love that. And on PC, you've got kind of fresh blue ocean there where you can go and, yeah. and surf away um, and find new customers for those that want them, right. uh, yeah. want to try it. So th that's kind of, I don't know if I answered anything. Yeah. Just well, and that's on. why like we continue to invest in Flight Sim. That's yeah. why things yeah. like Age of mm -hmm. Empires are yeah. so important to us. Why every one of our games ships day one on PC, mm -hmm. right? Which is something we do right. that not everybody mm -hmm. does, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, that, day one on PC, and this will be a, like, I don't know if people love this statement. Like, we don't look at the PC audience as a window, mm -hmm. right? It's a market. It's a market that does, we believe deserves our games day one. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going to ship our games. It's not right. about, like, later on I'm going to sell you those games so that something else happens. Yeah. Like, we, we see the PC market. We can do a better job with the Xbox app and the work that we have. But our games library and even our investments and things like Bethesda mm -hmm. was because of their PC heritage and what they can mean. Mm -hmm. Do you um, feel like you're convincing the, that PC audience that that uh, that you believe that they're a market? All I can look at are our users yeah, and right. the business. And the business has never been bigger. I think earlier I talked about we'll do over a billion dollars in PC revenue this mm -hmm. year. Um, and Game Pass is over 100% bigger than it was last year on PC. Mm -hmm. And our player base is almost 50% bigger than it yeah. was. So I just look, that's like, I don't know what else to look at. Mm -hmm. Can we do better? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, and we need to. Well, with regard to portfolio then, you want to be putting those titles out that people are going to think, oh, this is synonymous with Xbox, regardless of if they get it on PC or through Game Pass. Mm -hmm. How are you balancing portfolio with you know, the big hitters, the Halo, the Gears, the now Fable, I guess, with investing in new franchises, new teams that could potentially become the next mm -hmm. Gears? Awesome. Yeah, well, that gets back a little bit to what I hope we're trying to put together, which is a studio system that can support both of those, right? I mean, I talked earlier today about, it's amazing to me that we've got you know 10 franchises that have crossed 10 million life-to-date players, yeah. right? So you think about something like Grounded, which kind of brings all this together. It's a game made by a super small team at Obsidian, right? Kind of, they just, it was a passion project. Because of Game Pass, that thing finds an audience probably bigger than it would have if it had just launched into the wild. And now we're able to come back and support it. Now you look at Grounded, I mean, that thing is well over yeah. 10 million mm -hmm. life to date. Do, do we have the opportunity to invest and make that a bigger game? So a, a lot of what I do, working with Phil, working with Jamie Leader at Zenimax, is think about what is that balance across mm -hmm. the portfolio? Because I don't want to lose you know, Minecraft Dungeons was a big uh, expansion for us on Minecraft. That started with two people in Stockholm as a prototype in Unreal. Mm. And I remember very vividly a Thursday night, it's like raining after dinner, they're like, we want to show you something. And I think they expected me to sort of say, get back to work. That's right? and, I was like, <laughs> sure, yeah. and I'm like, that's yeah. Back to the mining. <laughs> yeah. 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 Put your, you know, get the yeah. pickaxe out, right? It's like, <laughs> and no, I was like, we got to, we built a team and we went and shipped that. It was a, a great expansion and that, open the door to do things like Minecraft Legends, right? So I don't want to lose that. I also want to make sure that a team at Compulsion Games in Montreal, small studio, it's you know, it's not much bigger than all this. It's like, you know, less than 100 people, um, double fine, or, you know, they're smaller and they make their kinds of games. I don't want them to look at a game like Sea of Thieves, which has been going for five years, or think about, oh, they're making, you know, they made five Gears of War, and think like that they can't have a place, right? Mm -hmm. So right. a lot of what I'm grateful for the support from Phil, this, the, the support that we get from our studio heads is there's room for all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what's gonna make us, sort of that'll be what makes us unique going mm -hmm. forward, is if we can get that formula figured out where there's room for all of that. I think we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of the actual show, but before we move on from Game Pass. Uh, one question about that that I'd love to see if I can get some insight on is, um, what's the kind of it, what's the kind of difference in business in terms of business? Is there a difference in the benefit that indie developers get versus you know a major studio like a Bethesda making a Starfield? And what is the kind of give and take that you have to you know put, factor in there? Because I imagine a smaller developer, you put them on Game Pass naturally my thought is it raises their profile, they get more people in, and generally it's probably good for business. 
Whereas I'm probably wrong here. Like a game like Starfield, which is a multi-million, probably billion-dollar operation. I saw you, Paul's tweet. Yeah, <laughs> I think he said a trillion. Yeah, yeah it's this trillion-dollar game. At least a yeah, it's this trillion-dollar game. You it wasn't the, the budget. Wasn't a trillion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's two trillion dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's this, it's this extremely <laughs> expensive game. You put that on Game Pass and it's free as well. Is it still beneficial, or are you like going, all right, we're going to take a loss on this one to raise the profile? What's the balance there? Because surely, like putting all these major games that are, you're spending millions on developing, marketing, and then making that away for free, giving that away for free, and then also raising the profile of this service where you can buy it, get it for free. Well, you you must be taking a hit somewhere, right? I I don't. I think everybody understands that Game Pass isn't free. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, okay. I get what you I mean. Make sure yeah. Yeah, 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 but like, it's, it's not the best marketing that <laughs> yeah. people still say, oh, for free? It's a cost of doing point. Like, yeah. Well, so Game Pass is profitable, Xbox is profitable, yeah. and it's a, com I've said sustainable. Yeah. People's like, is that profitable or not? Well, like, like, it, I think people get hung up on like, well, you're spending $70 billion buying something. You're making $70 billion a year, but that's, that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on. I'm going to take it back to console. Okay. Back like in, in the olden days when there were, <laughs> we just did games on console, and every time we shipped a console, we pretended that Sony and Nintendo didn't exist. So anytime you looked at a game, you said, "Hey, you're not shipping this game on the full console base. You're excluding, let's just call it two thirds of the market. We were like not always the same size, but let's just say we're going to go ship Halo Two, and we're Good not game. shipping it on Nintendo. We're not shipping it on Sony." Nobody ever asked me, hmm. hey, how does the P&L for this yeah. game work when yeah. you're not selling it so. everywhere you can sell it? Mm -hmm. But now with Game Pass... It's a paradigm shift. We're just like, yeah... I and people kind of yeah. get stuck and they yeah, say, right, well, wait yeah. a minute, you're not selling every copy that you could sell. How can you afford to go do those games? Um, the math is actually very, very similar. Yeah. You just, for us, what you did on old school console is you said, okay... How many consoles are you going to sell because Halo 2 launches? Mm. How long will those players stay on the platform? And how many games mm. will they buy? Right. And does that make it more cost effective to keep the game exclusive to your platform? And it, like, let's be clear, we could have sold Halo 2 on PlayStation and we probably would have sold a couple of copies. We probably could have done the a same couple, thing yeah. on Nintendo's yeah. platform. Yeah, yeah, one or two. Yeah. Um, so when I look at, at Game Pass, we absolutely are going to make money on Starfield, like touch wood, that that's the plan. Um, and we will grow Game Pass, and Xbox will be a better platform, both on PC mm -hmm. um, and, and console where people play. And for us, it's about expanding our platform reach, uh, and we think important games like Starfield will be catalysts for Game Pass growth on a lot of different platforms. But anytime you're growing the platform, mm -hmm. there's always this trade-off with games. We are not a third-party publisher, yeah. right? We do something different with our content like Starfield, but not all the content. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Minecraft ships on, on other platforms, mm -hmm. um, and we, we enjoy doing that as well. Yeah. yeah, just to jump in real quick on the developer side, yeah. you kind of asked, like, well, okay, let's say I'm the Forza team. Like, what, yeah, yeah. How, what's the, those teams, think about, for us, what's so important is the community, right? In a game like Forza Horizon 5, like, the hardest thing to do is if you launch a game, you build up a community, and then it dwindles, and then four years later, you've got to build that back up oh, yeah, and get right. ready for the launch. I think that if you were to talk to the Halo team, if you were to go talk to the Forza team, they would tell you that having that community that feels like they're always engaged right. and feels like they're always and making engaged, money is his job. Yeah, yeah. But they don't, and they don't have to. You don't have to put that energy into they ebb and flow, but you know you've got those customers. And I think yeah. for something like Starfield to launch into Game Pass and know that, and I think Todd even said this today, it'll probably be the biggest launch that they've ever done. Right, yeah. Because I those players know. are there right at the start. You talked about community building. Yeah. Does, have you got the telemetry or the data or the, the kind of like uh, vision on does Game Pass have a community now? Like, or, or do you see like people? Yeah, the network effect. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you yeah. see them like migrating from one Game Pass game to another, they or do. they come in, get their thing, and then leave and come back later? It's it's obviously both. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's some people who pulse in and out when yeah. a game. Mm. Shifts so which one would you into the service? You want, you want people to move around, right? But we don't make it that hard okay, to yeah. you know unsubscribe. I think mm -hmm. about early Netflix. Yeah. And it oh, yeah. turned out that. Are you like, sure you want to leave? Are you sure? Yeah. You yeah. Leave? yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> no, but actually in the beginning, so Reed Reed Hastings, who's the founder of Netflix was on the Microsoft board. Yeah. And I remember talking to him about our early growth in Game Pass, and he said he always wanted unsubscribed to Netflix to be right there. Mm -hmm. right. That people could, so that you didn't feel like, okay, once I get in, it's a spider web, stuck, yeah. and I can't figure out how to get out. 
So like we love it if people stay subscribed indefinitely. Obviously, like that's and we love if they use our console. But it's probably forever. easier just to make good games to make one and come back. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Okay. And we missed. I would say yeah. going back 2022, we, we we didn't have enough of those. But yeah, I was really well. We have 21 games in the show yeah. that are going to be. In I mean, but I think that the most surprising one to me, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was it's been a couple hours now. But yeah. uh, Capcom's Path of the Goddess. Is, yeah, that, that's a major third party game. Was it a beautiful? Yeah, yeah, very beautiful. It I mean, was we haven't seen a lot of that before. For like five minutes in my mind, it was a new Onimusha yeah. game, and I was soaring. But I was I was on cloud nine. And now what? Now that it doesn't. And now and then I came back down, and then I was like, on. and then I was like, you oh, gotta this. try new things. And dude. then I was like, you this is actually pretty things. cool. It's on Game Pass. Yeah. You then I saw then I saw yeah. it looks pretty cool, and Capcom have been absolutely killing it. I love they Capcom, mm -hmm. so I was like, benefit of the doubt every yeah. time. But uh, what, was, yeah, yeah. what was the conversation like to get one of these big publishers on board with Game Pass? It seems like that's been a long time coming. At least one a major publisher like Capcom, one I recognize from playing NES games. Yeah, yeah, so I think Sarah said this in our in our meeting that, or one of our kind of behind things that uh, all of the third party games that were in our show that were in Game Pass had previously been, like those either studios or publishers had previously been in Game Pass. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, but like day one though, is like, because Pat the guy, has Capcom, Capcom had a day one Game Pass I don't, game? I actually, I don't know. Yeah. Like I should, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't have so. all. I can't think of anything. Yeah. So, so I, but, just, I find that surprising and encouraging that so, Game Pass seems to be winning over these For supplies. a new IP, yeah. Yeah. teams that have seen, let's say the telemetry of what yeah. happens, because mm -hmm. even if it wasn't day one, like they understand what happens mm -hmm. when a game goes in Game Pass. Nothing I think is more of a testament to the work that the team has done on Game Pass than the number of repeat teams that we have yes. yeah. in the service. I like I just, so. yeah. whether it's day one or not, I love them in day one, but like that's going from 33 Immortals. Mm -hmm. You know, you just think about mm -hmm. these teams right. that have been in before. Um, and, and I love to be able to guarantee, I think you asked the question about yeah. smaller teams. You know, we sign a deal with them. I think about Game Pass as a content fund yeah. mm -hmm. that right, we're right. creating revenue for us that we can then go put back in the market to go create a higher floor for teams when they're thinking about, okay, what, how is this gonna sell? Mm -hmm. Because we don't gauge our Game Pass deals on how many units it sells or something. It's when the game goes in, here's the payment that you get. I also like, frankly, when those games ship on other platforms. Mm -hmm. Now, not every team can from a focus standpoint, because then they can really use the community feature yes, of yeah. Game Pass mm -hmm. right, to yeah. sell more copies on Steam sure. or sell more copies yeah. on Switch or PlayStation. And there's a benefit to them being in Game like Pass, but it's part of their marketing. Yeah. Do you do you see like Game Pass being used as a kind of risk mitigation opportunity? Where obviously new IPs are very difficult to get off the ground, even in this day and age. We live in a world of sequels and remakes and that kind of stuff. So does Game Pass? Do you see Game Pass being a, as a as a means to be like make this new thing, put it on Game Pass? Maybe it will pop off. At the very least, you get some baseline level of success. Absolutely. Yeah. I might. Just because I'm I'm part of the team, I might talk about it as teams aspire to maybe try to innovate a little more and right. kind of out of a safe yeah. zone yeah. Mm -hmm. because they 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 have a guaranteed revenue source yeah. from us mm -hmm. and we've we got direct reports of teams of we wouldn't have done this yeah. if we didn't know. Well, I remember you on this couch ten years ago talk about like you play a lot of Destiny. Yeah. It's like we're seeing people don't play a lot of other games. They're playing Destiny. Yeah, yeah. Why, why are we making all these other games? It's like a oh, tough conversation. Yeah. And it seems like the answer to that was Game Pass, right? I mean, why is it you also play the Destiny? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but is, it, is it also the same for third party? <laughs> Obviously, first party developers feel more encouraged to do that because you. No, it is that. third party. Yeah. Third yeah. parties are yeah. also being like, no. we don't want to launch this. Capcom being like, we don't want to launch this on its own. But well, I'm not. I won't say that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, in yeah, terms of, like, I think Capcom, as you said, has been killing it. Yeah. Like they're they they would be completely fine. Yeah. Launching Path yes. of the Goddess. That I'm not saying money. Game Pass is like coming to the safe of that. <laughs> but when we're out there talking to teams and say, hey, can I can I get a Game Pass deal? I want this budget for my game. Sometimes we're two years ahead of time. And we like if the game fits on a, on like what we're trying to do mm -hmm. in the fit, then absolutely we'll sign those deals. And I think that's a good thing for the industry. For sure. <laughs> maybe a little bloated ego on my part, but I think it's a good thing when we have teams doing things like 33 player co-op raids and 33 yeah. Immortals. Yeah, yeah. I think that's awesome. A very specific. Very yeah. I love that, 33. Yeah. I just pulled that out player. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's right though, yeah. When it comes to the Game Pass catalog itself, what is the balance with, obviously, deals expire, stuff gets cycled in and out. What is the, the max number of games you think you could put on the service, keep the, that's not going to promote so a kind of choice paralysis with players mm. because such a good you know looking at Netflix right now. Do you have now? an opinion on that? I mean that honestly. Like I, yeah, I personally yeah. feel like uh, I didn't ask you. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> All right, but that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. But I mean, 
You go. It's, it's the question, because we talked about this. We talked about this recently. We did. Um, about like, uh, when the algorithm is like not trying to give you what you like, but it's mm -hmm. trying to promote what it wants. Yeah. Netflix was doing Netflix was doing that, and I can't remember. With, it was, I think you should leave. Yes, exactly, we were all, that's what we were talking everyone about. Is, everyone in our friendship group had finished, uh, I think you should leave season one and two, and Netflix would not push season three, even though yeah. it just launched. And so with Game Pass, I remember when I first started using it, yeah. I had, not issues, but I felt like the curation was not there for me, and okay. I wasn't necessarily mm. finding the games um, without scrolling through. But recently, there have been, you know, like more like editors picks. Here, if you like this game, you'll enjoy this, or you know, RPGs, which is you know my jam. Do you think? And I mean this honestly. Do you think there are too many games today in Game Pass? No. Okay. But then I, I'm I'm looking at you know logging onto Steam and yeah. just seeing just an absolute <laughs> deluge of yeah. things. And I feel like Game Pass yeah, it's, it's is, is better. Though, right? it's, it's, it's a different like, market, but it's more yeah, curated. Yeah, I'm yeah. not being, yeah, yeah. it's not everything being thrown at the wall for me. And I feel like Netflix is certainly in that position now where yeah. there is just such an overwhelming amount of content that I'm, I get discouraged from even going in. Mm. So as you know, part of the team that is building a library, trying to get people in, trying to maintain their attention, do you have this magical number in mind? to keep players invested in Game Pass. Well, I ask you, just to be clear, mm -hmm. like I ask you honestly, mm -hmm. because we're always, we're always kind of thinking mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if I, I, I have a... Make sure you oh, build yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You yeah. should, you yeah. should. No, but I Get wonder if that's... <laughs> I feel like we have a unique position because yeah. we are living and breathing every announcement, you know, every release date, you know. I don't like attention. <laughs> to write it every day, but you know, so I feel like as people who are incredibly clued in, too online, you might say, uh, we know what's there. We know what we're looking for. But if you are someone who just dips in every so often, is that going to be more difficult for you if there's too much choice? Do you know where you should be looking? You nailed it, as usual. The Thank number you. one piece of feedback we get from customers is I want the games for me. Mm -hmm. Like we thought early on that it was actually going to be for I get n number of games for x dollars a month, or we could use free. That seems to be the it's not actually free, um, but n like number a headline of games. If you say that. And what it's turned into, and it, like for the longest time, we still said we still marketed over a hundred games, even though like three hundred fifty games, because it wasn't actually the number. What people want to do is they want to log in and find a quality thing that they can go play, and they love the surprise things, mm -hmm. the things that weren't in their probably retail shopping cart, mm -hmm. but they said, oh, I can click on something and download and try it. And when we get kind of knocked, it's when we let something of lower quality in, mm -hmm. not because of the number of games, but because they want that curation mm -hmm. that you're hitting on exactly. And mm -hmm. um, so we're always trying to balance more mm -hmm. the I'd say the diversity of the portfolio than an absolute number, even from what our first parties yeah. build mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. from the third party games that we go get. Mm -hmm. So I think your point's spot on. You talked a, a little bit ago about um, about 2022 uh, being this light year and now we're in 2023. And for a while it felt like 2023 could be like this this uh, make or break year. I guess I, I think I talked myself into that. It's, it's obviously not. Uh, but you, a lot of games in the showcase today were 2024. And as we're going through it, I'm like, oh, so th this year's going to be, it's going to be Forza and Starfield. And then you showed a Starfield Direct that made me feel like I don't need anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how you guys are feeling? You guys are feeling pretty strong about this year? About 2023, are there enough games coming? Well, I think we're halfway through 2023. So mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on what's coming in the next six months. And I yes. think between Forza and a Starfield, that that's going to be a lot. Right. right. So, mm -hmm. um, but remember, don't go short on Monkey Island. I was, was just going to say, <laughs> let's remember that, that you've <laughs> got. That. Yes, you're going to keep getting updates from Sea of Thieves. Yeah. You're going to keep getting updates from Forza. You're going to keep getting updates on Minecraft. We're going to launch season four of Halo here mm -hmm. this coming week. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, those you know, my Dune vehicle at flight sim. Oh, I get my Dune or what's it called? Ornithopter. Ornithopter. I didn't have that <laughs> word. That's it. Is that oh. it? A bit of a dune aficionado. I have. I had that word. <laughs> I didn't uh, know that one. So, uh, but there's going to be content coming from all yeah. those. I have more grounded content that'll mm -hmm. continue to come out. So, um, I think the flight sim team now has launched an update a month for I want to say 20 months in a row, mm -hmm. which is just crazy cadence mm -hmm. of content updates, right? And so. in, in this uh, uh, flight simulator 2024, that's a new release, right? Yeah, so the, the team felt that there was going to be enough improvement in what we're doing with graphics. It doesn't come through. Sometimes I say to them, you guys are being a little subtle, and they assume that everybody's a, kind of an airplane nerd. I don't know if you noticed there's a tornado in there, in that trailer. The tornado is not, not, it's not canned. 
it happens because we're simulating weather okay. to that degree. That gets my heart. In flight, That's in my kind of game right there. Yes, yes, right? Absolutely. So they just advances in graphics in terms of how they're simulating the atmosphere, the flight dynamics. They felt it was enough of a leap forward that they're going to put a date on it and call it 2024. Right. That'll be the new baseline. Is that forward. is that in the uh, wheelhouse of uh, when you say you want to have like four major first party games per year? It is uh, going to be of that various scale of it could be a update to Halo or it could be okay no I don't okay. we don't count the updates so that means yeah. right. something new or something major right okay. so that you know that could be a Minecraft Dungeons which sure. I count as something so that's new. where the is that where right. the but it's sort of not going to be a Halo season four it's not going to be you know uh, Sea of Thieves okay. update or something like that, I love the right? discussion just like a little bit behind the scenes on flight sim so one of the things we do in the show is we're trying to think what things do we put dates on we obviously had our 12 like everything you're going to see is going to ship in the last 12 mm -hmm. the next 12 months and they didn't all ship in the next 12 months so we said let's be a little bit smarter about our dates this time always trying to get better mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of hollow knight fans out there that are very upset yeah, right? yeah. i was gonna yeah. say well, and, the yeah, they're not all the games i've like, heard about that it's, that's yeah, not you, but, yeah but well it, it kind of is no. like we <laughs> set the context for the show but anyway the the flight sim discussion was funny because we're sitting there, we're saying like, well, we, we know it's next year. Um, and then we're like, well, do we put 2024? Like, it's called flight sim 2024. <laughs> so like, like team, like, if you're gonna name the game, doing. flight sim 2024, you don't get to be 25. You like, go you're not gonna put out flight sim TVC. Like that's right. Like, that's so I said, we just need TBC. every team to name their game with the year yeah. in the name. Yeah. So maybe that will help. Put him into a corner. Yeah. 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 I, th I think like, oh, we haven't actually talked about the whole press conference. I noticed itself. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to get <laughs> on that before, before it gets too far, but um, like, we talked about it in various uh, kind of uh, our own corners and together, mm -hmm. and you guys haven't seen much of the response to it, no. so it's worth us talking about it as well. Yeah. I personally thought that it was one of the best uh, press conferences that you guys have done Thank in a you. long time. Mm -hmm. Not Thank only because you. the content was there, but also we talked about this earlier. Like the pacing was really, really, good. really well done. Like yeah. that is—I don't know if that's something that people pay attention Tina to. Tina like, Summerford is our producer. Right Tina, show. Tina, right. you, you yeah. killed it. Because also, awesome. like, it's—it's—it yeah. it's, it was Sarah at the start. And then there was a kind of mid, there was a little bit of Forza, and then you came in at the end, and in between it was trailer after trailer. And even though some of those trailers like weren't hitting for me, I never disengaged because it was the perfect length Good. each time. So yeah. is it weird that we're in, like you're in the business of like putting on these shows for us for, as well yeah, as yeah. making games? That must that be kind of yeah, like you're yeah. like showman and like you have to produce commercials for the entertain and, gamers. But that's why stuff. like we mentioned Tina. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because got we don't expert. Like yeah. we don't. Yeah. Okay. We have yeah. Tina yeah. Uh, Greeny Greenberg obviously Aaron yeah. plays mm -hmm. a big role yeah. in getting the show, our PR teams and our marketing teams. Like I don't know how do you I don't feel like we actually do we're responsible for the show, but no, they actually yeah, yeah. No, like even we plug into a structure at the beginning of the year yeah. that they set up and a process. I mean, the teams have got to show up with the goods, but even then, I will say, you know, um, there have been times when we've looked at a trailer and just said, it's tough on the team, but we say it's not going to be in this year, mm -hmm. and let's either save it for next year or think about another beat during the mm -hmm. year, and that's okay, right? I mean, we've really, I think, got to a point where they've set up a lot of good beats for us. We've learned yeah. different places to show stuff, and, you know, sometimes we make a call that that's not going to be in. I, I really feel a tight partnership, again, like you said, with Tina's team, with Aaron's team, that we get to show up to a process that guides us through it yeah. mm -hmm. and we yeah. get to feel like hey just here's the raw material you know it's like now you guys go cook up the, you cook everything up is yeah. it weird though that like it still feels like gamers are judging you based on what happens today uh, or is that is that fair because you said when you were talking kind of funny it's really going to matter when we get our hands on the controllers, that's right, right. yeah but so, but today there's a, there's a it's a still a big day for xbox even though no one played a video game really yeah. really for the most well part. there are there are some people playing uh, um, Starfield and Forza yes, back, yeah, but right. but yes, you are right. Like until our customers yeah. Yeah. have games in hands, like that's what's what's really important. I think at Xbox, we continue to have to earn the trust, yeah. and we're still kind of we've been in the business twenty years, but relative to the other console players, we're still the newcomers um, there. And I, I I don't mind the scrutiny and kind of bar that I think we're held to. Mm. Um, and I, I know for the Xbox Nation, maybe it's because we're part of a big multinational mm. Microsoft. People like the whole, are we in or out of gaming comes up every so often. Yeah. Is this make or break, which yep. some people say, yep. and which you know isn't true. Like we have so much, we're, 
the company's getting ready to spend $70 billion buying a publisher right. for us in gaming. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of support. But I also know that the Xbox fans, they, as you said, they want to see us compete. They want to mm. see us do well. And I'd say the flip side of that scrutiny and the questions are when things like today happen and I get, we get to walk out mm -hmm. on stage and just feel the kind of love, really, yeah. mm -hmm. of the community and the fans and see it online, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you it prefer doing the kind of closed set stuff compared to, you know, Galen Center, cars on stage, Keanu Reeves coming out? I love the live out. shows. Yeah. <laughs> I love, I, it bums me out, we're like, we show up, we hit play on a video, I'm like, yeah. come on. But um, <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, obviously, true. like you showed off Fable today, that's a big deal for you. There's a lot of games that people wanted to see that are now there now, and you put like 2024 on there, so you've kind of amped people up now. What is your strategy now going forward to make sure that you maintain that momentum? Because obviously there is, my thought is now, we won't see Fable again for months, and we still haven't seen any gameplay for it. Like that trailer was fantastic, mm -hmm. really good tone piece. Um, and, and I really enjoyed what was shown there. Why like, did you think it was gameplay? Yeah, as in like, as was, in like an actual like so run through of, of too, right? Where, where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a gameplay trailer. The, not this, not today. The last, the first time you guys yeah. showed yeah, 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 it, everyone's like, is this really gameplay? I thought there, there was like cinematics. There's sections of it, like yeah, yeah, the giant. Yeah, yeah. But as I in, mean, like, I guess we could try to break put, down. Put a like, on as in like something akin to the Starfield, where it's like, here's what it's like to play. Yeah. Okay. Here's a okay. mechanical breakdown okay. for you know the the meat and potatoes that gamers want to see, so they have a good grasp of what they can look forward yeah, to. Yeah, it's hard in these presentations yeah. first to like re to recognize like what it's going to feel like when we're playing a game and we like that connection yeah. is hard. Mm -hmm. I did. There was one moment where it's like clearly it's behind the back. They're running yeah, away exactly. from the big yeah. giant. Yeah, 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 and I'm yeah, like, yeah. That looks like gameplay. Uh, and, and but I think a lot of people will take it away as like mostly it was this this cinematic cinematic thing. experience yeah so a few things on that first i think it gets a little bit to what phil talks about about just the earning trust i think one of the things as we earn trust is that we can be a little more planful about how and when we announce things because i think that's a big part of managing expectations is we don't want to announce a game and then go dark for four years right so we would like to when we get to the point when we announce a game that we feel confident enough about the progress the team is making that we get into if we show up here that means next year we're here with this gameplay demo and then we launch sometime that year that'd be a great cadence to get yeah. into right um, I will say for as I because I've been thinking about this a lot as I look ahead to 2024 everything that we're going to ship I've seen builds of like yeah. very recently or played them or you know there's I've said this before, there's so much stuff on Fable that I, I get with Alan, I'm like, why did you just show this and this and this? Hey, no, no, because there's a lot of cool stuff in sure, that game, right. right, that I'm excited about. As I think ahead, even as we get into 2025, you know, we've I, I just, we've seen builds of games at the initiative. We've seen, I know just because they're there in Seattle, what's going on with State of Decay 3. Like we've seen these things. So as I look ahead to the next 18 months in terms of what we're going to be able to show and deliver and do that kind of right. gameplay, do, 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 do next that year. thing, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously yeah. confident, right? Because the teams are hard at work and they get that that's kind of the bar now, which is look, let's show it, you know, let's like come right. show up right. with gameplay and let's like, yeah. we're, you know, do a deeper dive when we show up. When it comes to uh, this year, Starfield is the big, the big thing. Uh, you, today we confirmed it's it's 4K 30 on console. Do you guys feel like gamers got used to uh, uh, 60 frames per second, and that's going to be a hard bargain to make with them, or do you guys feel confident that they're going to get it when they're playing it? I've been playing Starfield since November. All right, you don't got to brag about no. that. Okay. No, it's not a brag. It's not a brag. Um, a little bit brag, but the uh, and the gameplay is great. And you know, at some point, not to get all geeky about it, but there's there's render time yes. per frame, mm -hmm. and teams can either want to like go horizontal or go kind of deep on a frame, and it's I think it's a creative choice. We obviously have games that are running at 4K 60 on the platform. It's not a platform issue. It's a it's a creative decision. Halo yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think I I trust what BGS. The decisions they make and I trust what I'm playing mm -hmm. uh, and we handed the controller on a console to people here um, and had them play done the same thing with Forza and I you know, I don't ever want us to turn playing games into a math exercise yeah mm -hmm. that as players we say hey 
you know, if, if the song doesn't have this number of tracks or the game, and I'm not saying that 60 or resolution don't impact what you play, but I don't think we want that to turn into an Excel thing. Right. I think you want to give the creatives the tools to make the best decisions right. and, and let, and, and, and the game will be what it is. Yeah. I think Starfield's going to be a great game and I love the reception today and I, I don't want to kind of force specs on yeah. every game before they start. Uh, kind of diverting back to the question before this, you talked about like, you know, showing the games that you're planning to have out. Does the absence of a game in this showcase mean that it's not in your timeline for the foreseeable future? Something like Perfect Dark, we haven't seen for a while. Does that mean that it's not factored into the upcoming um, kind of uh, the year? Or is it something that you're like, oh, we just don't want to show it right now, but it could still show up soon? No, I mean, okay. uh, we've got a show, we have different beats through the year, we got to pick what we're going to show where, when it's the right time. Um, the, uh, what did I, I, I was talking to Daryl Gallagher, mm -hmm. the studio head for Perfect mm -hmm. Dark, and he and I joke around a lot, we've been talking a lot, and he's like, he goes, uh, you know, today I got to watch the show as a, as a fan, because mm -hmm. he hadn't been part of the process, and he goes, and I think that if uh, I don't stay on schedule next year, I will definitely be watching it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> a little extreme, not, but it's not sure. the way we manage teams. But he Get gets that, right. you know, all the teams, believe me, they know when they are up next. And we've already, like Aaron and I have even had conversations about like, what does this show look like next year? And what's going to be there? And who's going to be ready? How do we feel about that? So I wouldn't read anything into okay. what's not here. And remember, we've got... Gamescom, we've got the Game Awards, we've got likely maybe another event earlier in the year. There's right. other beats for us to show stuff. Yeah, the, the thing I, I would say, I think your question is a great one. Um, when we sat back and looked at this show, and then looked at next year's show, and even looked at next next year's mm -hmm. show, and like all of it's kind of wrong, but we were very confident in the portfolio that was coming. And I don't I'm usually not the like beat my chest person. I'm, I'm still not trying to do that. Mm. But it, in some ways, it was kind of inevitable for us that after a slow 2022, mm. right, 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 we've got over 20 studios. When you think about the Zenimax acquisition and the acquisitions prior and the teams that were already there, that at some point, unless both of us need to lose our jobs, um, and I've, I've been Twitter fired a lot in the last sure. month, <laughs> sure. um, <laughs> that we were going to hit our stride and be in just a great rhythm of shipping games. And when I look forward and like I had complete confidence in what the team's doing and very excited about the things that we haven't shown. Mm -hmm. right. And I, I think the, uh, the, the thing that th that will get a response and it will be, we always hear, wait till next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do, you, what do you say to someone who's like, we've heard this dance before? Yeah. I'll just say that Starfield shipping in September, yeah. Yeah. that Forks is shipping else. in October, yeah. that Hi-Fi Rush shipped in January, yeah. that Legend, H2, you know. legend. Like it's, there is a Redfall thing that I'm not going to avoid. Like that yeah, yeah. creates right. a mark mm -hmm. for us. But I don't think it's fair to say we haven't shipped a game this year. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's right. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to close the year very strong, right. mm -hmm. both like relative to us and even relative to competition. I feel good. And then when I get into next year, I feel equally strong about yeah. what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. But I, I get the like yeah, yeah. after 2021, wait on 2022. Like that's what I say. We got we have to earn it. Yeah. Right. But we yeah, I think Starfield and, and Forza are gonna be great big releases this year. Well I mean as well, you're talking about next year, you said twenty twenty five too. How many years ahead have you yeah. sort of even in the back of your mind have an idea for based on conversations you're having with teams on projects that might be very, very early in development? Well, we were just in Obsidian on Friday and <laughs> saw a pretty good roadmap. I mean, when you start to think about you know, what's the future of Halo? What does that roadmap look like when you start to think about... <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> machine games. games. Yeah, yeah, come, come on. on. Oh, where's oh, Wolfenstein? Oh, where is yeah. Wolfenstein, okay? Yeah. Where's Indiana Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Like, sure. But to, to specifically mm -hmm. answer your question, um, we try to look out about as far as a typical production cycle. So mm -hmm. one of the things that has come up a lot today as we've talked to people is just, is there a bit of a reset on expectations around production timelines? It seems that people still have two to three years in their head. There are a lot of games that could be made in two to three years, but a lot of big games are more four or five years. So 
it's my job to think about, okay, so what happens after you ship Fable? What happens after you ship Motorsport, right? Like what is that roadmap? And it generally goes out about one production cycle, which would get you into 2026, 2027. Mm. And it is, is that becoming more difficult to manage as there are more studios? Uh, well, it, it, we've got a great team. I mean, yeah. it's um, you know, it's not like I sit there with some board, you know, moving sure, stuff around. That is what he does. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Ouija board. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a matrix. It's <laughs> a Merovingian. Not. Just like looking yeah. at yeah. little screens. But we have got a whole team that looks at portfolio. <laughs> and honestly, the teams are the ones that manage that, right? Like, so they bring to us, look, this is our plans. Mostly for us, it's to start, and this is something that great that we're in this position like how do we avoid we don't want to ship this on top of this like what would it mean to move this around now some of that this phil will always point out you know things where they don't slip early <laughs> right so as things slip and moves a lot of that collision <laughs> takes care of wouldn't itself. be nice if they did it would it <laughs> my job a lot yeah. easier um but uh we definitely take a look at that and it's right. going to be something that you know i work with jamie leader at santa max Bethesda, where we spend a lot of time thinking about let's not have mm -hmm. all the shooters launch in the same quarter let's try to keep some mm -hmm. of these rpgs away so, so you guys do think about that like, yeah okay yeah, yeah. you know like with the traffic jams and stuff yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. um starfield yeah that was a lot. It's um, the biggest, I think thing, it's the biggest, biggest thing, one yeah. 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 we've ever I done. Thi oh, the, the thing that I now ask, oh, I'm thinking about, and it must be terrifying, is like, how do you now manage expectations for a game where you've basically shown that you can do anything, everything? Because obviously, like, you've, it's now been raised to this point where it, people are thinking crazy things about the potential of this game. When it comes out, how, how do you manage the expectations in the lead up to it? And are you prepared for people to be extra, apply a scrutiny that they would not apply to any other game? One, because it has been raised to such a high profile and two, because Bethesda has this history where they make these games that are massive and incredible, but obviously they're also, the bigger they get, the more of a house of cards it sounds, seems, seems to become where a single knock here breaks X, Y, Z thing. How are you kind of, are you confident in it? Is this a different kind of Bethesda that we have now, where they're like, we've got all this under control, it's going to be rock solid. I think we probably both jump in on this one. I'll say the team has definitely matured, right? Mm -hmm. They've got, you know, mm -hmm. the Fallouts and Skyrims and Elder Scrolls under their belt. Truth be told, when the acquisition closed, this game was had a significantly earlier ship date than where we're actually launching it, right. even significantly er later than the date that we Delay. once had for the yeah. game. Mm -hmm. But it was earlier than that before. So sitting down with Todd and the team and explaining that we want to give this team the time. I think Matt says we have every QA person <laughs> in our entire company. In the state of Washington. Like and playing, yeah, 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 yeah. playing um, Starfield right now, looking at bug counts, looking at quality of where we are. Uh, the, the nice thing about what we showed today from my perspective is that was the game. Hmm. Like that's, I've been, as I said, we've not a, a little bit humble brag, but there we go, you yeah. know, we, we've been <laughs> playing the game for quite a while and yeah. that is the game. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I will also say when you look at things like Skyrim, mm. it's not like that team hasn't launched games that have just, right. mm -hmm. you know, hit a level of expectation that yeah. um, is, so it, I love the anticipation to your question about is it fair of being first party? I think part of being first party yeah, is the be, level yeah, of yeah, kind of attention uh -huh. you're going to get. And I think Todd and the team are, are really primed for that. And I love the reaction. We didn't know what the, we had like 40 plus minutes on one game. Yeah. And we didn't know what kind of engagement was going to be like online and whether I, people were going to, and it was pretty amazing to see. I don't know if you've got more room. No, I would just echo first, we have an awful lot of people internally playing it. And I'll just say I, you know, working with Todd and the team, I, I see bug counts and yeah. you know, I'll just say that just by the numbers, if it shipped today, this would be the, you know, have the fewest bugs that any game from Bethesda has ever shipped with. And that's, if it would, that that's was a, today. That's a right? good so thing to we've got, <laughs> we've got more time to go. I like the bugs. I, I start to I think, though, about <laughs> Skyrim and where that community is still 10 mm -hmm. some years yeah, later. Yeah. And you start to think about other things that they've done with the game. I, I think that there's 
there's just potential that'll get unlocked in the game right. over time as people discover all the different things. And they haven't talked about everything. In nope, the movie absolutely. What, what, is, more? what is left to talk about? <laughs> what? Uh, well, uh, Todd does that. I didn't see any romance options. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we, got, we got time for a couple more questions. I think uh, the one thing is that about 10 years ago, you were on this couch and mm -hmm. Jeff asked, Hey, games are shipping broken. What's gonna What's gonna is stop that? Is this the that? one where Kudo looked at me instantly? Yes, it is. Yes, as it soon is. As the and question, it, that right. guy. <laughs> I think clearly nothing's changed there, and it's not going to. So I, I guess the question is: is why not? I mean, if it's it, making games is hard, so why hasn't it changed beyond that? Hmm. Uh, I don't know that it hasn't changed. I think as an industry, have we have we gotten better at shipping quality? I don't know. Like we could go back and do the math. Games have never been bigger or more complex than they are now. Like I, every time a new technology comes along, Matt and I laugh that this is going to be the technology that makes creating games easier and less expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And all it does right. is raise mm. the bar of expectation mm. and complexity. Yeah. And teams work really hard to go meet that. Um, I will say one of the things that we talk a lot about our teams with now is we want you to be amazing at the things you do, yeah. but you don't necessarily have to do everything that every game has ever done, right. which has been an evolution for us. If you think about our, our games, you've got multiplayer, you've probably got some kind of like creator mode, you've got single player story, you maybe have co-op, and when the games were a little bit less complex, you could maybe get away with that, but yeah. even then, I think the complexity would overwhelm you at some point. So when we're talking to our teams now, it's Pick the things that you want to be world class at, yeah. and just go. And we look at like the Hellblade asset today. Like yeah. you know what Ninja Theory is going to do. They're going to have an amazing, believable character in a world that's just mind twisting um, and put you inside of her mind. And that, and we want you to be world class yeah. at that. So we've tried to help reduce some of the expectation of complexity. Yeah. But games are just so big, right? It's not yeah. an excuse. If you go back to 2018, when you and I talked, I remember a conversation we had was like, look, we're going to go uh, acquire Double Fine. And I remember asking you, like, are you good if Double Fine ships Double Fine games for the next 10 years? Because we're not yeah. going to acquire Double Fine and they're suddenly going to go, you know, create this huge open world game built by three other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. You know, and and Psychonauts 2, to me, was the, like my Perfect, yeah. one yeah. of my favorite games of that right. year. Like, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And so I think to your exact point, part of that is helping them set the expectation of you do you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, you, and go do it well. But please don't feel that you've got to go. Right create this, you know, game of and all And Todd things. decided to create a galaxy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> He's a madman. you got to yeah. do something about him. He kind is. Of, kind of Great like, jackets, though. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, 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 you kind like of it. like a cynical kind of observation based on no, discussion. No, really? Okay. I'm not cynical, <laughs> but like I'm trying to channel the people who are out there that are like, going to be thinking about it, and I've seen having discussion. One of the things that someone might say is like, this broken system where people are shipping, we've also kind of formalized it, have we not? Like with early access and, and that kind of thing. So a lot of people like me see the value in early access with a game like Hades, for example. Yeah. An incredible experience. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a just a deluge of games that come out that are half done. And what do you think the impact of having that in the ecosystem of releasing games does to games as a whole when someone like me who is interested in the game sees a game come out and immediately it's like, this is not done. And I am like, well, I've got all these other things. No, you nailed play. it. It's it's what's your intent with early access. Yeah. I think if it's you're getting, you're putting into early access as cover for it's not done. For us, I grounded was in early access for almost a year before it shipped 1.0. The intention there was get feedback from the community mm. on how this thing plays and what people want to do mm. and how we can lean in. What we've got a year, what more can we do? Right. So I think you've got to be clear on what, what's the reason you're going. Because I think you're, you're right. You don't want to use it as, as cover for something that's just yeah. not done. And last thing I'd say, and I know we're almost done. Yeah, no worries. On the, in the end, the player votes. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there are yeah. great games this year for people to go buy. And there are games that came out, including from us, that were below the quality that they should have been at. And they didn't sell. Right. And there's and great games I don't have time for as well. Like I got yeah. choices yeah. all over the place. And, yeah. and I don't love it when one of ours or another game comes out and it's not what the team had kind of gold themselves mm -hmm. in the beginning aspired to go create. But in the end, the gamers the gamers get to vote with what they play, what they pay for, um, and what they buy into. And I that in the end, like it is kind of survival of the fittest at right. some level, and, and and the market will will shake itself out, and we will all learn from the things that we do and others try that, that don't work. Cool.
Matt, Phil, thank you guys so much for spending time with us. Uh, Last thing, the Hexen t-shirt. What's it Yeah, what's the deal? Yeah, come on, man. You know you should not wear a t-shirt unless you really want that thing to exist, okay? Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver, make it happen. Tam also has a pitch for you after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For Hexen or, no, okay. (laughs) No, for Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver. Yeah, okay. Really, what's my we'll get yeah, what's the deal with Hexen? <laughs> Are we gonna Hexen? Yes, no. Is that a video game? We're Hexen. gonna see this conversation <laughs> offline, everybody. Thanks for watching. Till next time, like 10 minutes. Awesome. See yeah, you yeah. there for the last second, guys. everybody. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming on. Two seconds, whatever. Thanks, guys.